This is going to be Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And we're going to look at the subject of nostalgia and the song of fools. Look down at verse 10 in Ecclesiastes 7. It says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. So he says, What is the cause that the former days were better than these? Do you ever sit around and say, I miss how it used to be, or I miss the good old days, or it used to be better than it is now. And then look up at verse 5 where it says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about nostalgia and the song of fools. We're going to talk about songs that make you look back and remember a certain time in the past, you know. Sometimes you'll hear a song and it will remind you of a certain time period in your life. So sometimes you can be just maybe in the grocery store or at work, anywhere, and a song will come on. And it will remind you of when the good times were more important than your good name. There was a time when having a good time was more important to you than having a good name or a good testimony. Ecclesiastes 7, 1 through 4 says, A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So there are certain songs that will take you back to when a good time was more important than a good name to you. Years ago, there was a song of fools that said, I don't give a blank about my bad reputation. And that's the attitude of most people. That was probably your attitude before you got saved. And those are the words of a fool who thinks precious ointment is better than a good name. Ecclesiastes 7.1, a good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death and the day of one's birth, your good name is a good reputation. One of the qualifications for a pastor is to have a good report. In 1 Timothy 3, 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. Many Christians today don't realize how far a good name goes with the lost world. When you pull up at work listening to the same song of fools that the world is listening to, this ruins your good name. You ruin a lot of things because your flesh wants to have a good time. Something as simple as a song of fools playing on the radio could give you nostalgia and remind you of the good old days when you were a servant of sin. Many preachers have a name associated with being greedy, with being money hungry, which is why the name Creflo Dollar is so funny. It sounds like a pimp or a rapper's name. It's he, because I mean, he's nothing but a crooked pimp. He's trying to make millions off the Lord Jesus Christ because he thinks the precious ointment means more than a good name means. Jesus Christ is the good name. In Philippians 2, 9, Wherefore God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He showed how much more precious a good name is when he left heaven and came down in the flesh with no place to lay his head. He wasn't even close to preaching health, wealth, and prosperity. He believed a good name was better than precious ointment. In Ecclesiastes 7.2, he believed it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Jesus Christ went to the house of mourning. Over and over you read how he was moved with compassion towards sinners. You read how Jesus wept. You read how he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, and his sweat were as it were great drops of blood. You read how he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 
He stayed in the house of mourning. So can we not watch and pray just one hour? Jesus chose the house of mourning over the house of feasting. You should go ahead and overthrow the tables in your house of feasting sometimes and turn it into a house of mourning. Because verse 2 said it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. The house of mourning is the end of all men. Even if the house of feasting is what got you there. You may let the good times roll as the song says. <clears throat> but that will bring you to the end. You better go to the house of mourning now. That way when the end comes it's going to be a lot easier. Ecclesiastes 7.3 Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The hard times are better for you than the good times. By the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. When you are living for the good times, you aren't getting any better. Usually the older people get the more conservative the older they become. You start going through some things that will give you a sad countenance. It will make you more conservative. You start going through things like death, heartbreak, and surgeries, and rebellious children, and divorce, and hard work. That's how you build some character. You get out of bed. You work a factory job every day of your life and go in whether you feel like it or not. That is what will make you better. Working a job isn't a good time, but it can give you a good name. For example, my pastor worked 42 years at the same factory, pastored the ch same church for 20-something years at the same time, and has been married to the same woman for 50 years. These things give you a good name, hard work and dedication. To do these things for so long, you go through hard times and you spend a lot of time with a sad countenance. This way, your heart is made better. There will be good times and there will be bad times. And verse 4 says... The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. The fool wants to take the easy road every time. He doesn't want any adversity. If you want something, you have to work for it. And the same people who don't want adversity are the same ones that envy you for what you have, but they don't see the time you put in to get where you're at. They have the good times. They love the good times more than they care about a good name. Like the song of fools by the band Kiss, they said, I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. The songs about getting drunk and partying are innumerable. That's what they want to do. And many times the devil wants to put things in your path to remind you of certain things. Many times we need to leave the past in the past. And Paul says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. But a song of fools will remind you of the good times before you cared about a good name. And then the nostalgia will hit you. And the devil can use that to maybe have you relapse. But the next thing it will remind you of is maybe you're driving down the road. Somebody messes with your radio and you hear a song and you're, you're reminded of when you loved heavy metal instead of hard preaching. Remember back when you loved heavy metal and you hated hard preaching. Back before you knew Avenged Sevenfold was a Bible term. Back when the only Sabbath you ever heard of had Ozzy for a lead singer. You'd be surprised at how many band names have biblical terms of some form. Bands like Lamb of God, Saving Abel, Petra, Judas Priest, Incubus, which is a devil that has uh, sexual intercourse with a sleeping woman. That's what that band's name means. It kind of reminds you of Genesis 6. Do you know there is a band named I Hate God, spelled E-Y-E? -E? Remember the blasphemous name God Smack? They may have meant God smacking them, but the average person thinks they're smacking God. So, you know, it's blasphemy to name yourself that. These are the bands that make the song of fools, just some of them. Ecclesiastes 7, 5 through 7. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear 
the song of fools. It's better for you to hear hard preaching, the rebuke of the wise, than it is for you to hear heavy metal. Those are the songs of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This is also vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. It would be better to have one sermon by a Bible-believing preacher than to have every rock album from the last 40 years. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise, even though it hits you where it hurts, than to hear the song of fools. Look at any country song in the top 10, and I guarantee you it will most likely have some references to alcohol. And the Bible says if a man drinks alcohol, he's not wise. Proverbs 20 and verse 1, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And you have no business putting down people who drink alcohol if you listen to the same music that glorifies them drinking the alcohol. So probably 95% of country songs are songs of fools. You can be listening to a song and it takes you back. It's like the Kenny Chesney song talking about, I go back, and he starts um, talking about all these things in his past. You start feeling nostalgic. And someone who used to drink might hear a Brad Paisley song, and it reminds them of a time when they were having so much fun drinking with their friends. Or a man who struggles with fornication could hear an old song with explicit lyrics that reminds him of, reminds him of his fornicating days. The songs of fools are a tool of the devil. You can't help but hear it because it's everywhere you go. Have you ever been at work and a song comes on and you think about how much damage the devil did with about three minutes? A three-minute song. Do you, um, do you know how much perverted the minds of people have gotten who listen to Nicki Minaj and Cardi B? The songs of fools are a quick way for the devil to affect the masses. I mean, look at the trending section of YouTube, you'll see these songs of fools are getting billions of views. They'll get 10 million views within hours. There's 10 million people. At least 5 million. I know some of us probably watching it more than once and making the views go up, but I mean, it's at least 5 million people quickly defiled by the filth. But next, the song of fools will take you back to a time when you only cared about the present and you couldn't wait for the future. This country song they have out talks about how he wishes he had just five more minutes and just one more drop of the good stuff, the good times, he says. But you see, it's all vanity. And he's forgetting the end of the thing is better than the beginning, if he ever even knew that. He might have because a lot of these country singers was raised up under the Bible. There are so many songs with lyrics that talk about staying young forever, never wanting to grow up. What you have in the music industry today is old men and women who have to stay looking young to appeal to the young men and women. That is also what a lot of contemporary modern uh, megachurch pastors do. They dress like they are in college when they're old. And they're trying to appeal to the younger crowd who only care about the present and can't wait for the future. When you're a kid, all you care about is the present. And you can't wait to be 16. But yet you're not willing to put in the work that comes with getting older. All you care about is the present. But you're wanting the things that you get when you're older. Then you can't wait to be 21. Then you can't wait to be 25. But at the same time, all you do is live for the moment. You're not wanting to do any of the responsibilities that come along with getting older, but at the same time, you want all the benefits that come with getting older. You don't think about the consequences of your actions. Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. It is the end that is better than the beginning. And if the end is better than the beginning, then why are you always wanting to go back to the beginning? Some people live in the past. They want to go back to the beginning. And some people love when they get deja vu because that's the closest they can get to going back to the past. They think, I've already, I've already been here before. I've already done this before. 
and that's the closest they can get to going back to the past. I've had several older men tell me that they wish they could go back in time knowing what they know now. And you know, maybe if they did that, maybe their life would be different. But if God allowed them to go back and do it over again, by the time they got back to the same age that they are now, they would come to the same conclusion, which would be that they wish they could go back one more time knowing what they know now. And man would never be content. No matter how many times he went back and lived his life over and changed some things, the eyes of man are never satisfied. He would always want to go back one more time. Each time you went back, you would probably mess up something that would make a problem in your future that you didn't have the first time. But better is the end than the beginning. Don't try to go back. Don't wish you could go back. You may be young and your life is just starting and you go to a funeral and you see that person who has just died and you dread that day that you'll die. But really, the end is better than the beginning. The person who died already made it through the hard times, especially if that person is saved. The hard times are over for him and now he is in heaven without pain. If your saved grandmother dies, she's in a lot better shape than her 20-year-old grandkid. She's in heaven. She's met the end, the end is better than the beginning. The Bible's like this. It's better at the end because at the end, eternity shows up, and that is better than the beginning. Back in the beginning, the devil and the fall of man showed up. Are you only thinking about the present? Remember, you do have an end, and remember, you are going to spend eternity somewhere, and if you are saved, it does matter what you're doing with the gift of time that God has given you. And for those of you who are saved and have your eternity fixed, the devil wants you to look back and think how sweet things were before you were saved, when you were free from righteousness, however, you were a servant to sin. Israel kept wanting to look back. <coughs> we remember it, in Numbers 11, 5, it says, we remember the fist, which we which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the uh, and the onions and the garlic. You know that, remember that verse in Numbers 11, 5. We remember the fish, which we did eat in Egypt freely. See, when you think back, you only remember the good things and the the best things about the past. You, for, you tend to not want to remember the bad things. Israel must have forgotten how they were under hard bondage back in Egypt. Your past is never as good as it seems. But the song of fools will turn on and you'll think, man, I wish I could go back to when that song first came out. The song of fools will remind you of when you fought in bars and not in spiritual battles. That's the next thing. You'll be reminded when you were fighting stupid physical fights instead of spiritual battles. The country singer Toby Keith, who sings about alcohol and having a good time in almost every song because it's a song of fools, has the popular song, I Ain't As Good As I Once Was. And the song is about how he isn't as good as he used to be. So he's living in the past. He used to could fight in bars, but now he's getting too old and he would just get beat up now. But the problem is that he shouldn't wish he could still fight and be as good as he once was. But he should have obtained enough wisdom to know that that's ungodly. To not be in the bars anymore. But he didn't gain any wisdom. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. If he had gained some wisdom, he would know it was foolish to do all that stuff. And there are, there are some songs <coughs> that would get me ready to fight. As a lost person, if I thought I was going to fight someone, I would put on a certain song and it just makes you want to fight. But Solomon said, be not hasty to be angry. You have to watch your temper. You have to watch the hateful words you say to other people in anger. Most situations you get mad about are pointless and people notice that you're getting angry. It goes back to your good name. You're going to ruin your good name. And you would fight. Before, you would probably fight at the drop of a hat before. 
But now you have the fruit of the Spirit. What are these? In Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no, no law. Now that you're saved, hopefully you know that the bands like Papa Roach and Limp Biscuit and Alice in Chains and Nirvana and Bullet from Our Valentine are contrary to wisdom. These are the songs of fools. If you get mad and beat someone up, what was the point of it? You just beat up someone's son. You just beat up someone's grandkid or husband. You have to realize when you deal with other people, the person you're getting angry with or about to hurt, that person is someone else's whole world. Do you want someone angry and beating up the person that is your whole world? Almost everybody that you're dealing with is important to somebody. And when you hurt someone else, you don't just hurt them, but you hurt the innocent person that loves that person. And if you hurt a child of God, this hurts God, their Heavenly Father. You need to realize you're not just hurting that person, you're hurting other people in their life. Ecclesiastes 17, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Don't say you used to have it made. Sometimes I think back to an old job and I think, man, I had it made on that job. But you're just choosing to remember the good things about it. It had a whole long list of stuff you hated about it as well. Some people that wish they were a kid in school again or that they were back in high school. I never think that because think about it. You couldn't drive. You couldn't leave when you wanted. You couldn't come and go when you wanted. You couldn't choose where you were going to eat that night. You didn't have as much responsibility, but you didn't have the freedom. You you missed the no responsibility part. That's the only thing. You just, like I said, you want the benefits of being older, but you don't want the responsibility. You don't like that part. So thinking back to when you were a kid and wanting to go back, you're forgetting about all the hard times. And there's a lot of hard times that come along with that. Ecclesiastes 7, 11 through 14. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Wisdom, if you've got it, that's a defense. Money is a defense. But it's wisdom that giveth life to them that have it, not money. Consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? See the difference there? Straight and crooked. If someone is not straight, what are they? They're crooked. In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. In the day of prosperity be joyful. So be joyful over, you know, blessings that God's given you. But remember, prosperity doesn't always mean you're doing good. You see, a lot of people, like the TV preachers, they suppose gain is godliness. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. Be glad for the things God's given you. But that's not all that matters. Wisdom is better. Wisdom is better than money. A good name is better than precious ointment. And some song of fools will take you back to a time when you thought you would live forever. Taylor Swift has a song glorifying being 22. So she is partying like that. And there is that song party like it's 1999. Now, everyone who partied in 99 is over the hills now. But in 99, they were singing a song they thought was called We Are... They, they were singing a song that was called We Are Young. You know that song, We Are Young, We Are All Young, or however it goes. While they were partying like it's 1999, now they're close to 50. And they're still probably doing the same thing. 21 Pilots has a song where they say, I wish I could turn back time to the good old days when our mother sang us to sleep, but now we're sh stressed out. These are the song of fools wanting to go back to the good old days. 
if they could go back to those days, they would wish they could go back to to the time they're presently in now. They miss the no responsibility. See, these are songs of fools. In Ecclesiastes 7.15, All these things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. You see, Solomon hates the fact that a good man will die even though he lived righteous, and a wicked man will live a long time in his wickedness. Noah lived over 900 years as a righteous man. The ages were crazy back then. Moses had a pretty long life as a righteous man. He lived 120 years. David died way earlier than Moses in in terms of how long they lived. Then you see men like Stephen in the New Testament who died at a young age. Jesus Christ died in his 30s. He got back up. You might die young, but you're going to get back up out of the grave just like Jesus if you're saved. The wicked man that lives a long time doesn't get back up. He may prolong his earthly life, but if he's not saved, it's pointless and it's a vapor. That's the thing. I'm sure there were wicked men in Noah's day who lived to be almost as old as Methuselah. Can you imagine a wicked man living 900 years and how much more wicked they would become over time. Ecclesiastes 7.16 says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? If you're righteous over much, then you're pretending to be more righteous than you really are because nobody can be righteous enough. Or if you're righteous over much, you have convictions about things that aren't even in the Bible and you try to push it on everyone else and you end up destroying yourself and other people in the process. Don't make yourself over too wise, over much wise, he says. Don't walk around like you have all the answers and like you're a big know-it-all and can never be wrong. Because if you do this, then when you come to something you don't know, you feel like you can't say, I don't know. You done set yourself up as having a reputation of, I've got all the answers. And it will make it hard to humble yourself and be able to say, I don't know, or that I need to study that. Ecclesiastes 7.17, Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Everyone is wicked in his sense. Some people are over much wicked. That is how you most likely were when you listened to the song of fools and did whatever you wanted to do without worrying about the consequences of your actions. If you're over much wicked, then you're going to die before your time. They have that saying, you can't go until your time comes. I believe that's true in a sense, but you can also shorten your days that God was going to give you by being over much wicked. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Ecclesiastes 7.18, It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. The one standing at the end when everything is all said and done is the one who feared God. If you believed on Jesus Christ, then you feared God. You feared him who was able to cast both soul and body in hell. If you did it, then why would you have even got saved? But sometimes after salvation, you might start to lose some of that fear. How do you know if you're fearing? Well, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. If you're fearing God, then you're wanting to do what he says, and you're wanting to abstain from the things that he says to not do. That's how you can know if you're fearing God. Does it matter to you if you're pleasing God by keeping what he says in his book? Ecclesiastes 7.19, Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. Ecclesiastes 9.18 says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. It's wisdom that's good. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. Take any ten UFC fighters and put them against a wise man, and the wise man is better than those ten mighty men. He can retain his wisdom, but they will eventually lose their strength. They might be able to face men and fight them and win, 
but a wise man can face life and fight and win. The UFC fighters and wrestlers and boxers and uh, all these different types of fighters have their songs of fools playing as they come out of the tunnel to the ring and they showboat and they walk with a lot of pride like Conor McGregor. And these are mighty men who could literally kill 90% of people with their bare hands if they fought them. But the wise man knows proverbs sixteen eighteen says pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall the mighty men may win a couple battles along the way but he has a fall coming mighty men who believe that they are mighty eventually self-destruct the wise man knows this when a young uh, new hire comes in for me to train and he thinks he knows it all after a while i'll just stop training him and let him self-destruct and it doesn't take five minutes for the mighty man or the person who thinks he's mighty to realize he's not so mighty if you you've, i've had some humbling experiences in my life to show me that i'm not a mighty man at all and it's only by god helping me that i even make it for example i can get a big six foot four guy with big muscles and he comes in he sees me a, a little guy and he thinks well if this guy can do the job then I'm going to be owning this job. So he gets cocky, and then they begin to train you. You know how you get a new hire. You're supposed to be training them. They start showing you a, a better way to do it. And I'm thinking, I didn't, I didn't make this job. I'm just going by what they told me. And you're going to come in here your first day and change how we've done it for 100 years. So I let him self-destruct. And then he says, man, I don't, I don't think I can do this. You see, I had to let him self-destruct. I had to let him get humbled first, and then I can train him. When I started my job, I kept the thought in my mind, God, there's no way I can do this unless you help me. And there were still times when I thought I couldn't do it, and that is doubt creeping in that you have to fight. But you have to remember Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And if you give an effort and ask God to help you, then you can face the things that come up in your life and you don't have to be a mighty man. I'm by, I'm by far from being a mighty man. By no means am I one. I don't even think I'm one. But with God's help, you can <clears throat> outlast the mighty man even the ones who think they're mighty men, because wisdom strengtheneth more than ten mighty men. Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There is a song of fools by Luke Bryan, the wicked country singer, that says most people are good. But Solomon said, the wise man who ever lived, he says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The song title, Most People Are Good, that's a foolish song title. Solomon said none of them are good. Paul said there is none righteous, no, not one. Some philosopher said men are naturally good. Not true because Jesus called men evil. He said in Matthew seven eleven, if ye then being evil. I know some holy holiness people who think that they're sinless. You have to be ignorant of scripture to think that you're sinless. The wisest man who ever lived said you're a sinner. And you're a sinner before you're saved in a sense of your flesh. And you're a sinner after you're saved as well in the sense of your flesh. In this, when, before you're saved, your soul is stuck to your flesh and your soul has sin applied to it. That's why you're going to hell. After you're saved, your soul gets cut loose for your, from your flesh. And that, even after you're saved, your flesh is still sinful. But your soul is made perfect by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So before you were saved, you were doubly wicked. After you're saved, your, your flesh is still wicked. It's still going to sin. You're not going to be completely have victory over sin until the rapture. But your soul, the difference is your soul is cut loose from your flesh. And it's perfect because, G, because the Lord sees Jesus Christ. When he sees your soul. That's the difference between a saved person and a lost person. It's how the Lord sees your soul. In 1 John 1, 8 through 10, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So you can't sit here and tell me that you are without sin. Because those verses said that you have sinned. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 and 22. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken. Lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. These are great verses. What Solomon is saying here is basically... Don't get bent out of shape over all the criticism coming your way because there has been plenty of times where you have criticized others, probably criticized the same people that's criticizing you. You're going to have to learn to deal with criticism, learn to deal with people saying rude things, learn to deal with insults and people making fun of you. A lot of times people are just teasing you because they like you as well. You also need to learn to laugh at yourself. When someone says something negative about you, don't take it to heart. And you know, the rappers, like the country singers, have songs of fools. And the rappers are always talking about haters. They get so bent out of shape and sensitive about people hating on them. He said this about me. She said this about me. A good portion of rap songs are responses to people who have dished them or hurt their little feelings, you know. Eminem's songs you say a lot of bad about other people because they said or did something bad to him and it hurt his little feelings. These are just oversensitive people who can't take any criticism. And we live in a very sensitive generation. If someone says something about you, just laugh. Who cares? Uh, for example, the wicked country singer Morgan Wallen, or Waylon, wherever, however you say it, was recently caught on camera saying a dirty word and they now consider him racist and he's getting a lot of hate i couldn't stand the man's music before this even happened all he talks about is getting drunk it's filthy music but the people waited until they caught him saying the n-word before they would go against his music they are looking too much into the things that are spoken 99 percent of of them people obviously have said a racial slur in the comfort of their own home. Especially since it's common for white people to listen to rap and all the rap songs say the N-word. So it would be impossible for a white man to listen to rap and not say the N-word. Is he not allowed to sing the song since he's white? I mean, that would be racist. A good idea would be to just quit listening to the filthy music. A good idea, if, if it's wrong for a white man to, to sing those songs, which I believe it is, not because of the N-word, but because of all the other filthiness in it, you know, then maybe white people should just quit buying rap music. But they wouldn't want that because, see, they want your money. But at the same time, you're not supposed to say that word if you're white. So you can't say a certain word because you're a certain color. That's racist itself. Now, I admit, you shouldn't say the N-word. I don't say the N-word. I'm not going to call somebody that name. A good idea would be to just everybody quit listening to filthy music, the country music and the rap music. And honestly, I have more respect for the rappers because most of them were raised in places where the Bible wasn't preached much. The country singers were raised in the Bible Belt, and their grandmother probably gave them the gospel, and they probably heard the preacher preaching on hell, preaching on heaven, and they are much more responsible for being as wicked as they are and leading people astray. Just like America is more responsible than Sodom and Gomorrah. But my advice to black Christians is if someone is truly being racist towards you, then those people are idiots and you should ignore them and their racial slurs at the same time. Don't get caught up in this racial distraction. It's a complete distraction. You are a child of the king, and you're no longer a citizen of this world. A lot of this, this racial stuff they're talking about is to get people fighting with each other. And the more that you talk about racism, the more it's going to be there. Because it's just letting people, just it's just fueling the fire. The more you talk about it, the more it's going to be there. It's like having Black History Month. I like uh, Morgan Freeman, although I'm not a fan of him. 
he had a good quote. It said, it shouldn't be Black History Month. It should be American History Month. There shouldn't be a White History Month. There shouldn't be a Black History Month. The more you make these distinctions about stuff like that, if you're wanting rid of racism, then quit making the distinction be there. And it's almost like if you get caught up in the racial stuff, it's almost like since you're black, you want there to be more rights for black people than there is for white people. You want white people to, to bow down and kiss your feet as you're, they're, you're wanting. A lot of them are wanting, wanting white people to do. You see, and that gives people the idea when they see this that all black people are like this. I don't know any black people that's like this. It's the ones that's on TV. I mean, and then it gives the black people uh, the idea that all white people are racist. I mean, I've, I live in Tennessee in Hillbillyville. I work with black people and white people. I don't ever see any racism going on. It's all just made up. And it's, it's I mean, I'm not denying there are still racist people. There's no doubt still racist people who still say racial slurs and that's wrong. But it's not as blown out of, they're blowing it out of proportion to get people to fight. And if you're a black Christian, my advice to you is overlook all that junk. And the more you let it bother you, the more you're just being brought under the power of wicked men. And Paul says, I will not be brought under the power of any. The more hurt you get and the more sensitive you get about it the more power they have over you the racism is wrong it's wrong to put someone someone down because of their their color their skin people can't help how they were born they can't help if they were born black or white or asian or tall or short you can't be judging people by how they look or treating them a certain way because of how they look or what they are the Bible says if you have respect of persons, you commit sin. Everybody needs to be treated the same way. We shouldn't just uh, pretend like the black race is superior. We shouldn't pretend that the white race is superior. But Ecclesiastes 7, 23 and 24 says, All this have I proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it is it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? The Lord can. He knoweth the deep and secret things. Solomon wants to find out everything. Even the wisest man in the world couldn't find out what the Lord knows. He said, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Have you ever tried to search out wisdom? Well, John 5.39 says, Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen, And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. Christians today aren't doing much searching. I'd say they have no idea what a concordance is. I'd say they have never heard of e-sword or sword searcher. They're not searching the book. But Solomon said, I applied my heart to know and to search, and to seek out wisdom, and the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. When I got saved, I remember I wanted to search and seek out wisdom. I know I wanted to know the reason of things. I wanted to know the answers to all the Bible questions that I had. And the more questions a new Christian has, the more likely they have been studying the book. It's not the ones without the questions who have been studying. It is the ones with the questions. And the more you study, the more questions that are going to come up. So Solomon said, I applied my heart to know and to see it, search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Solomon had all the wisdom a man could probably ever get and experience all the pleasure of the world you could probably experience. He did that too. Unlike the average person, he experienced both. He came out thinking all of it is vanity. He said in verse 26, And I find more bitter the, than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Who's, who pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. You see, Solomon had a thousand women, and he says more bitter than death is the woman. But Solomon was getting wives from other nations, and these were wicked women, and they turned his heart from the Lord. He wasn't supposed to be multiplying wives to begin with. 
and he was multiplying wives from wicked heathen places. I mean, imagine if if Solomon had good wives, how much better his heart would have been. Imagine if Solomon went by the commandment and didn't multiply wives and just had one wife, one good virtuous woman. Imagine if he just had one, how much better he would have turned out as the wisest man that ever lived. A wise man with a, a wise woman, that's, that's how you're going to live for the Lord. Ecclesiastes 7, 27, 28. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Proverbs 31, 10, Solomon says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. So Solomon could not find a good woman. Maybe he was looking in all the wrong places. But Solomon obviously had no luck with women. The best thing you can find is a Bible-believing Christian woman. This is the one you want to marry. Solomon says in verse 29, No, this only have I found that God hath made men upright, but they have sought out many inventions. We are still seeking out many inventions. <coughs> Those who invent stuff today, are mostly inventors of evil things, as Romans one thirty talks about. And that's all people are concerned with, the new inventions, the, the many inventions. And they'll subscribe to magazines and certain things on the Internet so they are up to date on all the new technology and inventions that are mostly just distractions. They'll subscribe to the to, to the new songs they want to know when all the new songs come out the songs of fools but this has been nostalgia and the song of fools